Hi, I'm James McGuire, editor of Datamation, and our topic today is cybersecurity, key trends and best practices for IT security. To talk about that, I'm joined by four of my editorial colleagues here at Quinn Street. With us is Ann All, managing editor of eSecurity Planet. How are you doing, Ann? Good, James. Thanks. And I know, you know, covering the, the topic on a daily basis, you know, managing the security planet, you're pretty close to the topic, I, I imagine. Yes, <laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> we're, we're, we're glad to hear that. Also with us is uh, Sean Michael Kerner, a very well-known reporter, senior editor at uh, eWeek and Internet News. Hello to you, Sean. Hello, James. How are you? Happy Good. Thursday. Uh, happy, to you. Th happy Thursday to you. And I, I know a few months back you actually traveled to Paris for a tech panel, did you not? Yeah, yeah, I've had the good fortune of uh, traveling to Paris. Uh, that was uh, November for uh, OpenStack, and that was exciting. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, I was uh, visiting uh, Chris, who I know we're going to be talking in a second here, back in uh, San Francisco. Hey, Chris. Hey. Uh, and we were uh, at RSA together, which was uh, very pertinent to today's topic. Uh, last week, I was in Vegas for Interop, uh, yeah. which had all kinds of security content, too. So making the rounds, talking get, to people. You definitely get around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also with us is Kachina Shaw, a managing editor of IT Business Edge. How, how are you doing, Kachina? I'm doing well, James. How are you doing? Good, good. And I, I know that, you know, as, as managing editor of IT Business Edge, that gives you sort of a global view because IT Business Edge covers pretty much the entire IT infrastructure. Yeah, it gives us a lot of chances to uh, cover um, high level and low level and then whatever we come up with in the middle. So it, it's, it's a lot to follow. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, Chris Primesberger, editor of Features and Analysis at eWeek. Hello to you, Chris. Yeah, good morning, everybody. How you doing? And, and I, I know that you are a veritable fixture in Silicon Valley, Chris. You're always getting down there. I'm, I'm thinking you're hanging with the VCs down there. Well, you know, I mean, they're neighbors. We all live together. We go to church together sometimes. We, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we're on the freeways together, kind of honking at each other while the, uh, the lanes are all jammed. It's, uh, they're driving tight their community. Teslas, of course. Pretty, yes, I, I'm yeah. not driving a Tesla. They are, but you right. know, it's it's a it's a neat community here. So cybersecurity, uh, Quinn Street just put out a new research report. It's a survey of all sorts of IT decision makers, and they talk about what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what products they're looking at, uh, their key strategies for security. I'm wondering, among the four of you. You know, what was it you found particularly noteworthy about the Quinn Street Research Report? Which, by the way, is a free download. I mean, what, what really stuck out to you? And was there something you thought was particularly noteworthy for the report? Well, James, there were a couple of numbers that jumped out rather alarmingly at me. Um, one was that 27% of small businesses and 24% of mid-sized businesses said that preventing cyber attacks was not a major issue for them. And uh, I guess I found that rather alarming uh, in the sense that uh, perhaps their heads are in the sand, um, mm -hmm. you know, with all of the data breaches that are occurring and kind of all the new methods that hackers are kind of using to uh, get into companies' networks that it should be top of mind issue for everyone, um, no matter what company size you are. And so I thought those numbers, I, I guess, seemed a little disturbingly high. Mm -hmm. Maybe some false optimism out there. Maybe a little false optimism, yeah. exactly. Sean, what, what struck you about the security report? What really stood out? What struck me? Uh, honestly, I, I wasn't too surprised. Uh, you know, we talk about these things every day on uh, eWiki Security Planet and the other uh, Quinn Street Enterprise sites uh, where we see uh, all kinds of reports where people say, hey, we've been breached. So the big number, the 76% number, may be a little high, not really all that surprising. Uh, perhaps what was more surprising to me, though, was the, uh, the difference between organization sizes. And uh, I encourage everybody listening to this e-seminar to download the full report so they can get the full color on that. But there was some disparity in the responses from organizations of less than 100 and those over 1,000 uh, in their responses. It just broad strokes. Those of more than 1,000 uh, tended to be uh, more uh, risk-averse thinking things were happening to them, and those of less than 100 were thinking things were not happening to them. So. That was a little bit disconcerting, but in general, really, everybody's saying the same thing. Uh, everyone's being hacked. We're all at risk. Breaches are everywhere. The right. sky's not falling, but right. uh, stuff is happening. A an another month, another big breach. You know what? In my business, I wake up every morning. Uh, I have some plan of what I'm going to write about, but I know at every morning, 4 or 5 a.m., there's a couple of standard feeds I check, and every morning there's a breach of some size, shape, uh, almost every morning without fail. 
Right. I, I think from the report, it was, it was 76 percent said that yeah. they had been breached at least in the last year, and I think companies don't even know when they've been breached. So it's you know many breaches out there. Uh, Kachina, what what stood out to you in the research report about security? Yeah, actually, uh, to your your point that you just made, it was interesting that 14% uh, of the total respondents said that they had not had a notable breach within the last year. So that may mean that they had something happen that they just don't want to talk about, or they may think that they have not experienced any sort of breach or infiltration, um, and then it might be interesting to find out whether uh, that was true of all 14% because from everything that we all follow every day, that seems unlikely, as Sean said. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Preinsberger, what, what did you think was most noteworthy from the research report? Yeah, the summary I wrote for eWeek uh, touched on a couple things you guys have already talked about, was that, you know, three full three quarters of the respondents admitted to a damaging breach, and that's just admitting to it. There may be some that maybe didn't want to admit to it or just didn't know it, but um, I think the word rampant is is not an understatement here. Mm -hmm. um, and like what Sean says, Sean sees this every day in his feeds, and he sees exact use cases. He sees the, the problems. Sometimes those those news cases or those uh, those news stories don't come up until weeks or months after they happen too. You know, after the company has processed it and decided what to announce. So the problem is much wider, much deeper than we know. I hear this all the time, as Sean does. I heard it at I heard it at RSA. I heard it at EMC World um, in Las Vegas, where I just returned yesterday. And uh, um, there's a lot to um, still a lot of work for everybody to do to uh, try to stem this tide. I don't even know if it's possible. You know, the, the thing that I noticed in the report, and it, it's actually uh, figure five, it's, it's purchase involvement by product type, and the decision makers are talking about, you know, what they're most interested in buying right at this point, and the top item at 77% is firewalls, followed by antivirus, remote access, uh, spyware blocking, but it's interesting, after all these years, you know, the firewall remains, you know, a, a key concern, but the irony of that is that I, mean, I think many security pros will agree that the biggest threat is is inside. It's actually the employees. It's end users. It's people inside the firewall. I mean, it was Edward Snowden actually took all, you know all the files out on a thumb drive for goodness sake. So, the firewall you know is is not the end all and be all to, to the answer. Yeah. No, not at all. Uh, it's part of the it's part of the solution, but it's only one small part. VPNs, um, you know, virtual private networks, firewalls, passwords, all those things need to be used, um, but there's a lot more proactive uh, uh, type uh, security that needs to come to the fore, and that's what where the trend is right now, is being proactive about it, is using data analytics to assess risk uh, among employees, and among channel partners, um, not channel partners necessarily, but could be anybody in your value chain, uh, like the target thing was not a target problem, it was one of their, one of their value chain members uh, right. that caused that one. So. Um, risk assessment, I think proactive with uh, data analytics and uh, big data study um, is what uh, is where it's going right now, I think. I'll just jump in there, uh, James, because I'm, I'm, I'm a network guy, so I love firewalls. Uh, and I think really the question is, uh, historically we always deployed firewalls at the edge of the network. Uh, and then to your point about insiders, because the perimeter has changed. So the real answer today is still firewalls, because that's your control point as a control mechanism, but some form of micro-segmentation. So you have, uh, whether it's uh, software-defined network constructs, traditional VPNs, or some other kind of micro-segmentation of your network where you have multiple sets of firewalls, multiple sets of choke points and control points where you're doing that uh, deep packet inspection uh, to protect against one microsegment against another. Let's take uh, Snowden for a, an example. Okay, maybe uh, an external firewall might not have stopped him, but if there was microsegmentation within the NSA's own four walls, as it were, at Fort Meade, then one area of the company wouldn't have gotten to another. So the firewall still has a place. The question is, rather, instead of having one wall, what we're talking about is many walls. Yeah. Sean, are people using those now, or what? Firewalls? Yeah. Just look no, at, no, no, no. I mean the segmentation. Not as much as they should, but, you know, that's that's something that uh, you and I probably heard a lot of at uh, RSA. The, uh, the VMware guys were talking a lot about it because, uh, you know, from a product perspective, uh, NSX fits in there. 
Uh, the Cisco guys that I spoke with, and I'll have some great stories uh, on eWeek and eSecurity Planner in the coming weeks on that, uh, are definitely advocating for that. Uh, and then some of these next generation vendors. But truth is, it's not actually happening as much as it should. This is more of a proactive, forward-looking thing that should happen, but it's not, to your point, Chris, it's not actually really happening widespread today. I think we've got to tell people about it first. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. Uh, Interested to get get the four of you's opinion on on what trends are are really shaping cybersecurity these days, whether it's legislation or whether it's you know startups. Kachina, what what do you think? What 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 are big trends out there in cybersecurity now? Well, I think legislation is definitely going to continue to be a big story right now. There's a lot of um, a back and forth a discussion about what needs to happen at the federal level as opposed to the state level. Um, and from the mainstream user, there's a lot of pressure on the federal level to somehow fix the problem of um, their data being collected or breached or otherwise misused. However, you know, as it turns out, some of them may actually already be well protected or better protected by some of their um, state laws that are already in place, and some of those state lawmakers are worried about being overridden by something that may not be effective at all. So we're going to be hearing a lot about that. And then another one that uh, we've been following at IT Business Edge that I just find really interesting is uh, an, an, actually an insurance product. There is a cybersecurity insurance protection, sometimes it's called by other names, corporate insurance perhaps, um, that companies can purchase. And it's been around for a little while, but right now it's really starting to take off. And I talked to a VP of a risk management company recently and she told me that in the last year most of the premiums for that type of protection have been paid by uh, SMBs but because of the enormously well covered uh, breaches in the last year enterprises are now starting to become um, hot commodities in uh, in this area and buying the coverage and it's going to grow up to a a two billion dollar uh, niche. It's the fastest growing industry niche right now in the world. Oh, I, I believe it. Yeah, it's cybersecurity insurance. That sounds like a, a very fast growing niche. Yeah, and so one interesting thing about it uh, that uh, we expect to see is that it actually can push some positive changes. Um, the premiums, when when a coverage is purchased, it can require certain protections to be in place at the um, at the client's place of business. If those are put into place they can lead to better outcomes, fewer difficulties, fewer breaches, and then that can lower their premiums. And so we have a very positive circle of action here going. A virtuous circle, yeah. <laughs> Sean, what's your sense? What, what trends are, are big and really shaping the security scene these days? Uh, for me, because I'll take the uh, pessimistic uh, approach since everyone oh, else is we, li we like pessimism. Uh, uh, seminar hangout here that we're doing, fear. Fear is what's driving everything today. Everyone is afraid. They are scared out of their pants. Right. They're going to end up in one of Chris's stories or one of my stories or one of Kachina's stories, one of Ann's stories that they have been breached. That's what's driving insurance. Insurance is insurance against fear. It's fear. And it's, and it's a justified fear. Business. People are scared because they see Target. They see Home Depot. They see J.P. Morgan. They see companies that are... 100 times bigger than they could ever hope to be in 100 lifetimes being hacked, not being able to defend themselves. They see Sony being attacked by, you know, North Korea, the Chinese, the Russians are getting into the White House. The sky is falling, for God's sake, here. And that's what's driving this business forward, is fear. Nobody wants to be the victim. But, but what's going right? If you, if you look at a trend out there, is there something going right in security today? Yeah, uh, actually, that's, that's uh, give you my two-second point of view, and then I'm sure Chris will jump in, too. Uh, for every problem, almost every problem, there actually is a solution. So the, the right answer, in many cases, is just a question of figuring out that right answer and, and configuration. But so far as I've seen, there are very few breaches that I've reported on, at least, that didn't have a solution. So there's not some uh, apocalyptic, catastrophic, uh, end, epoch-era ending uh, flaw out there from which there's no recovery. So there's an answer for all these things. It's just finding that answer. Chris, what's, what's your sense? Uh, a, a big trend uh, going on in security today? What, what's well, shaping things? Well, okay, there's lots of stuff to talk about, but I'll, I'll tag on what, what Sean was just saying. Um, it turns out that about 10 or 15 old 
backdoor holes in security are constantly being used. Okay, so if we can close those doors, we'll close a lot of the hacks coming in, a lot of the data breaches, but we're not doing that. Um, why? I'm sure I don't know, but um, what uh, what hackers tend to do is they've got this pro this protocol where they hit, you know, one uh, common uh, backdoor and then that doesn't work, go to the next one, et cetera, et cetera, and then by the time they get to about 10 or 15, they're in. Either they've they've found a password or they've they've gotten into a, a virtual private network or something. And, you know, if we can close those old doors that have been open for a long time, some people go out of business. Not all of them, but some. So that's that's a trend we need to look at. Is we need to relook at our systems, and when things were taken for granted. We got to plug those holes. So that's not a trend. It's just a piece of advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I did hear when we were talking about. Um, uh, a minute ago about these nation states and you know what Edward Norton uh, what's his name had it Snowden had it Edward Norton <laughs> sorry <laughs> him too yeah yeah it's, he kind of looks like him as a matter of fact <laughs> maybe he'll play him in the movie exactly but um, I heard a story at RSA uh, yesterday that I thought was really interesting and I, I bet you Sean's probably heard this one too but in Eastern Europe uh, namely Russia there are um, places that look like Silicon Valley I mean they're big tall skyscraping, not skyscrapers, but uh, really professional looking office buildings where people, you know, check in and out, do a code on the door or uh, put an ID card in and open the door and go in and sit down at a cube and hack. These are professional companies. It's a business. That it, It's business. It's yeah. big business. Right. And you would never know it unless, I mean, these are all kind of secret. They don't have signs on them saying, you know, Hacking Incorporated. Right. But these are, um, these are businesses that are Worldwide, they are extremely uh, sophisticated. They have things like um, complete call centers that sound real. They, you know, they act like banks and get you on the phone and tell you to, to give them information, et cetera, et cetera. It's all incredibly um, well run and sophisticated. That's what we're up against in a lot of these cases. And what, what's your sense of a bit of a, a trend shaping security these days? Well, I have to go with one of my smartest writers for eSecurity uh, Planet, Sean Michael Kerner, who is sitting in with us today. The and and uh, yes, and uh, I would say that basically uh, there's this growing awareness that the traditional perimeter approach to defense is not working at all, basically just not cutting it. You do still have to have um, traditional things like firewalls and antivirus, but um, now people need to use multiple overlapping tools. Uh, to get you know more complete protection. Absolutely, you know the the one thing I've noticed is is definitely the consumerization of IT has created its own security headaches. It's uh, employees using you know God forbid P2P applications through the company network. They have their own gadgets. They're using their own software. Yes. It's like you know it's the the the, the company has become a very porous entity, and there was something that Chris you had uh, written. I think it was from RSA. You you quoted from Jeff Moss who is the founder of the DevCon and the Black Hat conferences, and he said, you know, quote, I'd be really good with like 80% security because we're never going to get to 100% security. And, right. and, and, Sean, and Sean, you've got the prop, the actual Black Hat. Is, is that a, is a sticker from, from the show? Yep. You were, you were there. Yeah. Yeah, always good. Uh, yeah. What, what, about, uh, what about best practices for security? If you're going give, to give people a piece of advice, what, what would you point them towards? Chris, what, what, what's your take on that? Wow. Um, well, you got to—you have to be proactive and reactive. You got to have all the tools we've been talking about here, but you also have to look ahead, and you've got to try to figure out who might try to or want to get into your system, and you have to get to them, and then before they get to you. Now, that's not going to be possible in all cases, but you need to look at all your employees. Um, you need, to, frankly, and so this is a business. You're running a business. You've got to be objective about it. You may love your employees, but there may be somebody who's desperate and in trouble and needs to do something. Uh, make some extra money, and they can do it very quickly um, if the right person approaches them. I was at a Signet, which is a, a national uh, security um, organization uh, summit recently, and one of the first things that was set up on the stage is, hey, the easiest way for a, a bad actor or a nation state or a, a crime organization to get into your system is just to hire somebody from within and pay them lots right. of money. Right, an inside job. 
And, and we, we hear that 75, sometimes 75, maybe as much as 80 percent of all big data breaches happen from the inside. You got it. We have to stop that first. It's hard to do because the human element is a very hard thing to deal with. Kachina, your sense of a, of a best practice, what would you recommend to businesses? Well, um, I, I, I think that was all uh, some, some smart advice there, and I would build on that and say that um, thinking like your nemesis is always a good practice to try to get ahead of them. At this point, you know, I think on um, IT Business Edge and on uh, eSecurity Planet and eWeek, <laughs> We probably all said at some point that um, you're never going to get ahead of the bad guys, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't start trying. So on um, things like spear phishing um, or just phishing uh, attempts, people trying to get in through uh, through your employees, as Chris was saying, you know there are services out there that are um, quite sophisticated that will help train your employees to become a harder target and maybe encourage the, the hackers to move on if they are finding that there, it's just not easy to get into your company because these people are really uh, have you know it, it a front of mind um, attitude as far as um, being suspicious about emails or other uh, communication attempts that are coming in and uh, a couple good pieces of advice I got from a CEO of a company that provides that type of service recently were that your uh, training or any sort of education attempts like that should be much more than once a year. You're just going to kill them with a death by PowerPoint approach that way. Right. No one's going to remember anything. Make, make no. it ongoing. Make it ongoing. Yeah. Um, keep it fresh. And number two, make sure that the IT staff gets the same training. Not only so they learn uh, anything that they didn't already know, and also so that they know what their users know. Mm -hmm. Sean, best practices? What, what, what would best you tell companies if you, Here we you, go. you were hired, hired to be an IT security guy? I got some props. First of all, everybody listening in on this uh, Google Hangout, if you're not using this on your phone or on one of your devices, that's Google Authenticator, yeah. stop this thing right now and get two-factor authentication right now. It's, uh, a, it's a free download? Free download, two-factor authentication, because anybody can fish a single email. That's ridiculously easy. My 10-year-old can do it. Uh, you need two-factor authentication because with two-factor, it takes that second step, and that means you have uh, your own password, which you know, and then something you have. In my case, it's a phone. could have been an SMS. You add two-factor to any equation, and you're doing much better. There's two-factor you can do it on a phone. RSA has tokens. This is uh, one of my little tokens uh, that you can get. Uh, Dual Security has. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones. But the bottom line is it should be something you know, something you have. Uh, I can't tell you how many stories I've written for, for you, for eSecurity Planner, for eWeek, uh, where the first thing the company says, oh, we're going to put in two-factor authentication now. Well, great. Why didn't you do it before? Right. In the big iCloud hack with all the celebrities at the beginning of this year, which I had a lot of fun writing about across all our publications, Apple, $160 billion in the bank, and they did not have two-factor authentication enabled in iCloud. How stupid can you be? Yeah, so, I, I think in that particular case, they were concerned about the consumer market and not stymieing the consumer market with too much, in their view, complication. Yeah. But you know what? You have to have two factors. It's okay if you live in New York City, you're not going to have one lock on your door, would you? Right. You just wouldn't. It's the same thing. So have that. So number one, do that. Uh, number two, uh, and we've written about this at great length across all the various publications. But uh, I encourage everyone to do a quick look. Library of Sparta. Go site e Security Planets, e Week, or Datamation. Basically, it's this uh, military theory that there's a kill chain. So there's multiple steps a hacker has to do. A hacker doesn't simply, if a hacker simply gets your email, and with your email and your password is able to get into all your systems, you are a loser. You deserve to be hacked because that shouldn't happen. You should have, number one, two-factor, two, all your data should be encrypted. So even if they get your data, they can't do anything with it. Three, if you're an enterprise, have uh, log access management data loss prevention, and a reverse firewall proxy, something that manages stuff going in and out so that if uh, you know uh, uh, social security numbers, credit card numbers, etc., are going out, you can stop that. Just because a hacker gets into an organization doesn't mean that they have to get out. That's the bottom line. A hacker has to do multiple steps. All you have to do is stop them at one step. They have to do many steps. It's much harder to be an attacker than to be a defender. So the onus 
of course, the vic you should never victimize. You should never. We should never. You know, say the victim is at fault. But right. there are a lot of steps everybody can take to secure data at every step. Encryption, two-factor, log identification, DLP, firewall proxy. All these things can be in place. Uh, and then that limits the risk. Things can still happen, but at the very least, you're going to limit the risk of what that exploit can do to you. Right, because I, I think in many cases, hackers are like bullies in that they're looking for a softer target, and they come across a really you know, a hard perimeter. They're going to bounce around to the next target. That, like, it's just too much work to hack your perimeter. Well, exactly. I know we talked a little bit about Snowden. The Snowden thing was kind of ridiculous. Here we have a su secret, super secret spy agency and a contractor. You have to remember, Snowden was not an NSA employee. He worked for uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. And he had access to an entire network worth of secrets. How come that doesn't segment? That is ridiculous. It is now. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I said earlier, network segmentation across the board, some level DLP, you could stop that. So if you have that malicious insider, if you have a segmented network, number one, you would have stopped them. If all the data would have been encrypted, you would have stopped them. And then if you would have had DLP, you would have stopped them. So you have not one, not two, but three chances to defend your network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the other thing about it, I think in terms of like best practices, there's obviously you know specific technical ones like you know sandboxing a file. But there's something that again, Chris, you had written this. There's a quote from uh, Harry Kapanen from SSH. He said, "If you're not thinking about this part of the business, meaning security, eventually you will destroy your business." In other words, this has got to stay top of mind. It's not enough to to you know, hire a you know a security pro <laughs> or even put in a great firewall. This has got it's got to re remain top of mind. Now, a concern for security has to permeate the organization. Everybody has to be aware, and this includes the C-level, the C-suite people, and the board of directors, because without security, their businesses are going to be out of business uh, soon enough. Right. And um, I think Harry said, or Harry actually said, uh, he said, um, uh, your business, you could be destroying your business, destroying it is the word he used, mm -hmm. if you do not... Uh, uh, put enough uh, investment and time and effort into security, and I think he's right. Uh, looks like we may have lost Anne. She may she rejoin us, but uh, at any rate, I want to ask the, the, the three of you, or maybe the four. She comes back. Uh, looking ahead, you know what what's going to happen in, in cybersecurity in the next you know one, three, five years? Where are we going? Looking at your crystal ball, because you know what what do you see happening? What, what's your prediction for the future? Um, I see that um, at the board level, as Chris was just um, mentioning, right now the board in a lot of cases is afraid because of what they read in Google News in the morning, but they're not taking that to the office and asking for detailed reports on what is actually going on inside the business. and so. Um, in the in the survey, the Quinn Street survey, fully half of the respondents said it was not a priority for their company to be preventing cyber attacks, which is just um, dumb. It's it, so, it's hard, hard to believe, really. Yeah. I don't I don't know uh, why they would answer that way, but uh, I hope if we do a similar survey in the future, they won't answer that way, and that IT will be proactive, go to the board, and offer up the information that everyone needs to be aware of so that it can do some um, serious risk assessment and planning and budgeting. Um, and secondly, I would say there's going to be a lot of attention along the same lines to uh, third-party uh, relationships. There's going to be some trust issues that are going to have to be addressed um, once you're cleaning up your security stance um, and you feel like you're doing some good work, you want going to want to make sure that everyone you're doing business with is doing the same and isn't just undercutting your efforts. And uh, you, you've returned from the planet Mars, which we're, we're glad about. And um, <laughs> E-planet. <laughs> E-planet. E what, what do you think, looking ahead for the, uh, the future of security, what do, what do you see happening in the next few years, shaping things? Uh, I do think that people are moving, uh, Chris had alluded to this earlier, that uh, it's becoming much more about offense as well as defense. Mm -hmm. So you're not just trying to keep the bad guys out, you're trying to uh, deploy technologies that will help you catch them when they inevitably get in and then, uh, you know, kind of thwart them from getting all of your data assets. So uh, I think we're going to see a big move toward that. That will be largely through analytics that uh, can help you 
uh, identify anomalous behavior and again sense when they're there and respond quickly. Chris, looking ahead, I know you, we had talked a little about uh, some of the startups, but uh, I mean, maybe guard time. Or, but at any rate, what, yeah. what, what do you see happening in, in, in security in the years ahead? Okay, macro and micro. Macro yeah. level, the government is busily getting companies and thought leaders and the military and startups together to come up with some new ideas. They ha that's got to start somewhere. So it's starting up there, and the White House has been really visible and really active here in Silicon Valley. In fact, the DOD is just opening um, a, a new office here in Silicon Valley about security. That's what they want to talk about. So there's going to be a lot more um, business coming to the Valley because of this, and uh, that's the macro level. The, Co and collaboration, sharing, really. Yes, yes and they're sharing Collaboration is more of desperation, perhaps, but collaboration nonetheless. Absolutely, and it's better than nothing. So, I mean, right. companies getting together to share information on the hackers and the bad actors is a good thing. On the on the micro level, you mentioned the, the word uh, the term uh, guard time. This is not really a startup. It's a company that looks like a startup because it's new in the United States. But it's, I'm going to be writing about this soon in eWay. <laughs> guard time is from Eastern Europe, where they know security, and their security um, uh, is very granular. Okay, and so I think that's where security is going. It's going granular. In other words, guard time will look at every. Uh, document every file in a in a store, and if anybody goes in and touches it, or moves it slightly, there are notifications that go out to the right people. Hmm. So, if a hacker gets in and starts stealing documents, people are going to be notified immediately in real time, and then the uh, the doors can be closed. That's the general uh, aspect of guard time, but there's more to it than that. I think that's going to be a trend going forward is protecting individual files encrypted like uh, Sean was saying earlier everything's encrypted notifications going out quickly so that the damage can be uh, kept to a minimum Sean what do you see you, you've got you've got a crystal ball what do you, what do you see uh, for security in the next one three five years yeah crystal ball lucky for me in the next one to three to five years I see or, 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 or ten years what the heck yeah, well, we'll talk short term the next uh, couple years I see little changing which is good for me it means job security uh, and no shortage of things to write about because uh, wonderful companies like the ones that uh, Chris Kachina Ann, and I get to write about are, are fantastic, but these are not uh, pervasive technologies. They'll be pockets. Uh, really what I think has to happen is uh, security needs to be baked in at the protocol level uh, and at the operating system level, which it really wasn't. When uh, you know dearly departed uh, Mr. Ritchie designed the C language, it didn't have type safe memory. Uh, just one example. So when I write about uh, security vulnerabilities, 100 out of uh, 101 are use after free memory vulnerabilities, and that's a functional flaw in the C programming language, which is still the root of just about every program you and I use. So, now there so are say the type of vulnerability again, because I was pretty fast. After free, uh, or UAF, use after free memory vulnerabilities are pervasive, and it's right. a functional flaw in C, and that's just how it is. They're increasingly difficult to find. Long story short is uh, we're using Google today, uh, Google Hangouts. Uh, it registers. It gets access to memory on your operating system. Uh, Hacker X wants to use that memory, so when Google uh, stops on your machine for a fraction of a second, it's still using that piece of memory. The attack code uses that same piece of memory. The machine thinks it's Google. It's not Google, and then bad things happen. That's a, a pivot. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I'm oversimplifying it, but these things happen. Uh, you know, I know uh, Chris talked about uh, Jeff Moss, founder of DEF CON and Black Hat, great guy. One of my favorite things at DEF CON every year is the Wall of Sheep, and it never ceases to amaze me. And I've been going to DEF CON for 20 years. You go to the Wall of Sheep, and you'll see sheep. These are people who were authenticating on a hacker network. They're going to a security conference without using SSL security. Uh, and the reason why that happens is because security is not baked in by default. We should have HTTPS, that's SSL, TLS, secure transport, everywhere for all sites. That includes uh, our own sites, you know, eWeek, the Innovation and Security Planet. I'm sure we'll head that direction eventually. Uh, at the protocol layer, HTTP2, which is the next generation of HTTP, will take at least five years till it's pervasive, but that has protections. Uh, at the operating system level, Mac OS X continues to get better. Uh, I'm a big Linux user. That continues to get better. But Windows 10 is a massive leap forward uh, for security. So my opinion is these things need to get uh, baked in at the standards and at the operating system level. So 
it's wonderful that there's all these add-on ecosystem vendors and players, but that security is no longer bolted on as an afterthought, but rather is a foundational component of computing from the source code on up. You, you do see Windows 10 as a big step forward, huh? I do, and I'll tell you why. Because the memory protections, I know I talked about memory protections. In Windows 7 and 8, they have these things called, uh, what is it, ASLR, Address Space Layout Randomization. Uh, and in Windows uh, 7, they introduced Advanced Depth, Data Execution Protection. In Windows 10, they've pulled in things from Emmet. Emmet is Microsoft's Enhanced Memory, Enhanced Toolkits, EMET, you look it up, mm -hmm. uh, which... This is also amazing. Whenever I write about a Microsoft exploit, I'll contact Microsoft and they'll say, oh, yeah, we've got a pitch coming, but you can just run Emmet and you're safe. So what they're doing with Windows 10 is uh, smart people there figured out how to back some of that stuff from Emmet into the mainline operating system. So some of these memory right. safety features are better. The other thing that uh, they're doing better is some of the user access controls and the like, um, and that's happening also on Windows Server. Uh, because what happens is in almost every attack that I see, uh, there's a privilege escalation. So if I hacked into your account, James, I should not get entire access to everything that you're connected to. I'd have to get elevate my privileges. So the new versions of Active Directory have wonderful access controls to improve that. So they're making steps in the right direction. They know what they have to do. It's a process, and it's going to take many years. Mm -hmm. Well, we're thinking, you know, very hypothetically, Sean, I know this is a, a side issue you're an expert on. What happened with, with the Starship Enterprise? What, why was that hacked so many times? And, and isn't it applicable to, to market it? We need to get to the bottom of this. All right, I, I got to give everybody my little prop here. This is my, my little Scotty. <laughs> not Scotty's fault, okay? Don't yeah. blame engineers. Engineers are doing the right thing. Right. But uh, I'll tell you my, my favorite example, because we like to think, okay, the Starship Enterprise was hacked by the Borg, it was hacked by the Klingons, etc. Some Star, bad Trek, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, the greatest movie of all time. Khan and the USS Reliant is coming up on Kirk's Enterprise, about to blow it into oblivion. And what does Kirk get? He gets the prefix codes for the Reliant. What are prefix codes? Backdoor. So the, uh, the uh, Starfleet, in their infinite wisdom, had backdoor codes for every single Starfleet vessel. And by that backdoor code, they're able to hack into the Reliant, lower the shields, and Kirk survives. So... Uh, Star Trek shows us that, you know, the Enterprise itself can be hacked, but Starfleet itself put back doors on all of its ships. So wow. really it's it, it works it works both ways. In Star Trek II, it shows us, you know, well, having that back door was helpful uh, for, for, you know, Kirk, not so helpful for Khan. But uh, it, it happens, and it's just a functional equivalent. And even, I know we're talking about security in three to five years. Star Trek, let's say, is 300 years in the future. Right. Uh, just goes to show us that if Star Trek is a vision of our future, 300 years from now, we can still look forward to uh, hackers infiltrating our systems. And if I'm still alive, more job security for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot to think about. Very good. All right, great. I, I really appreciate uh, the, the, the four of you, your expertise. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the link. We can all tweet about it. And uh, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. All right. All right. Have a good day. Thanks, James.